Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. I think we're going to start with a video that explains kind of what I do better than I can, and then we'll take it from there. When you look at the restaurant world, a lot of times there's a big disconnect between what a chef is actually preparing on a daily basis and what they actually care about. What they do is they work at a restaurant, and then these chefs go home on Sunday, and they prepare meals that kind of tell their story. And our hypothesis is that people want the food that tells a story. My name is Brian Bordanik. I'm our chief executive officer. Dinner Lab brings together emerging culinary talent in a city, so the number twos, threes, and fours that are at major restaurants that are kind of idling in their career and gives them a platform to cook for an eager audience. So without further ado, how about you? So basically we're doing a Colombian menu that my aunt made for me uh, every time I visited Colombia. We never use the same location twice, and we're always in a space that's not a restaurant. We kind of mess with every variable that you can possibly mess with, which basically puts kind of chaos at the center of our business model, which is really challenging, but it also makes for a really interesting product. So they have an event, something's going to go wrong. There's no doubt. Welcome to New York. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good service, guys. Thank you very much. And you have to be able to roll with those punches and think really creatively on your feet because that's what we do. People pay up front for access to the calendar, and with that working capital, we're able to secure our commissary kitchen, um, our employees, all of our training, and basically operate a market. In most of the primary markets in New York, LA, uh, it's $175, and in New Orleans, Austin, Nashville, it's, it's $100 for access to the calendar for, for the year. We know how many people we're preparing for. We never waste food. So everything is done beforehand. We haven't actually taken funding to date. And that's kept our vision really in line with what we want to do. Your feedback that you have on your cards, we actually aggregate all of that. And then our chef for the night will sit down with our resident chef here in New York and go over how to get better. So our members are trying to help a chef develop a menu concept that they actually care about. And the great thing about um, the operation is that we get feedback twice a week per market. So what we're trying to do is take a lean startup methodology and really put it on top of the restaurant world. Because if you look at how most restaurant concepts start, it's not until you cut the ribbon, open your doors, and food critics come in that you actually know what you really have there. So if you have a cool concept, let's test it. And we're not like a social dining platform. You know, We're not like trying to save the world or anything like that. But if you think about it, how often do you really dine with people outside of your social group, outside of your racial group, um, with someone who's 20 years older? And what's cool is when you use food as a common medium, you're kind of bringing people together that don't yet know they want to be friends, but will be friends. And that's been really cool. Cool. That was like a uh, three-hour interview that she condensed down into two minutes, so she was able to make sense of, of my nonsense, which was nice. Uh, so my name is Brian Bordenick. I'm going to explain a little bit about sort of how I got into food um, and then where the concept from Dinner Lab came from and then sort of what we're up to uh, today, and then we'll leave time for some questions. So um, <clears throat> the concept for Dinner Lab, I, I wish, had more noble roots than it actually does. Uh, at the time, I had moved down to New Orleans, Louisiana, right after Hurricane Katrina. And uh, I was working in early stage education technology investing. And that basically means that I was putting capital into organizations that were trying to get off the ground. The thing about education entrepreneurs as opposed to hospitality entrepreneurs is that education entrepreneurs tend to take themselves very, very, very seriously. And um, you know, I was talking with people who had a uh, you know, behavioral modification platform that thought they were saving the world. Uh, and I got really tired of that experience and just wanted out. Um, all the organizations that we started uh, took a couple million dollars to get off the ground, and we were working really in that uh, ideation stage to early revenue generation. And I knew I loved that space. I, I loved having a concept and being able to work really aggressively to getting it off the ground. I just knew I didn't want to work with these people. So um, my next idea, I swore to myself, uh, would be started with $200 in my bank account. I didn't want to have to go up to anyone and convince them what I wanted to do was a good idea. Uh, I just wanted to be able to take cash out of my ATM, and at the time I didn't have much more than $200, uh, and I wanted to be able to get an idea, or at least test an idea and see if it had legs. So I pulled out $200, I found a chef, and the concept for Dinner Lab, uh, where it started, was 
let's fill uh, the late night dining community in New Orleans. So New Orleans, Louisiana, is a place that you could drink at a bar until about 7 a.m., uh, but your last table service typically happens at about 9.30 p.m. So we had the brilliant idea to say, let's bring people together at midnight. What could be wrong with that? Well, uh, our clientele was completely inebriated uh, when they showed up. Uh, so we started doing these dinners at midnight, and I was looking around the room, and there was the business model was successful. People were paying up front. We were working with chefs and you know feeding them. But it got to a point where I was like, even if this business works, I, I don't want to run it. Um, I mean, we could have been serving people hot dogs. They wouldn't have really cared. Um, so we decided at that point uh, to get away from the midnight dining and actually move into the 7, 7.30, you know, normal dining hours. Um, we quickly figured out a few things. One, the idea of pop-up dining uh, is not a new concept. There are pop-up supper clubs in every city across the world. And we figured out what everyone else in our industry already figured out, which is that this business model is challenging to make money. So we were working with these chefs, and we had a business concept that made no money. So we weren't exactly this data-driven organization that we are now. Um, we had to think, how can we actually make money and sustain an organization? So we came up with the concept to say, look, if we're actually going to be if, do this, and we want to do this well, we're going to have to hire employees. Well, how are we going to get the working capital to hire employees? Let's actually come up with this membership model. Let's make it slightly exclusive and charge people up front just for access to the calendar, which basically is charging people for nothing. Um, so in New Orleans, uh, we charge today as well, we charge about $100 for access to the calendar for a year. And in some of our larger markets, we charge you know, up to about $200. But this is a way for us to sort of see, oh my goodness, will people pay up front for this? So I had lived in New Orleans, it was post Katrina, I'd done a ton of work. I thought we would flick on the light switch with this membership model and we would sell thousands of memberships. We sold 20. Um, <laughs> So here we are, we're sitting with this brilliant idea that we hatched together and we sold 20 memberships. And I was like, there's no way, this is, there's no way there's a business here. In the first week of operation, we rented a ground floor apartment um, and we're cooking illegally out of that apartment. Um, a hurricane came through New, uh, New Orleans, collapsed the roof of my kitchen um, or apartment and our one employee quit. So we were basically uh, looking at each other and saying, this, this is a terrible idea. This is God's way of telling us to stop uh, and stop now. But like any good entrepreneur, we, we ignored the will of God and uh, decided to keep, uh, keep moving forward. So we basically, we stuck to this model because we were sitting in this weird space where if we opened it up to the public, we would sort of lose that brand credibility. What I was confident in was our ability to put forward an interesting product. So what was that product? Well, head chefs didn't take us seriously. We weren't going to get a, a Michelin star rated chef to go cook out of a ground floor apartment uh, and then cook in a random building somewhere. So the people who were coming to us were the number twos, threes, and fours at major restaurants. The interesting thing about the restaurant world is that the average sous chef, saucier, chef de cuisine, stays for about one to 1.2 years at their establishment and then they leave. The reason why they leave is because it's one of the few industries, the industries that we work in, where someone could be 27 years old and feel like they've hit the pinnacle of their career. But that's what happens in our space. So what they do is they bounce around the industry for about four or five years, eight years, and then they either get a head chef job or they leave the industry. Most people who have been chefs for a while are like, I'm 31 years old, I passed a kidney stone, I don't really wanna do this anymore. And that was sort of, that frustration is what we tapped into. And it wasn't because we were brilliant designers, it was because no one else took it seriously. So here we have all these sous chefs and sauciers that were coming to us and saying, look, we would love to cook a meal for you guys. The thing is, is that I don't wanna cook some meal that we're doing at our restaurant. I wanna come up with my own concept. So what we found about the restaurant industry, or our secret, is that a lot of these chefs are classically trained in something or passionate about something, and then there's a huge disconnect between what they're preparing on a regular basis. So you'll have, uh, in any major city, you'll be attracting culinary talent from all over the world. But the way that the restaurant industry works is, I want to open an Italian restaurant. Here's my concept. You can cook Italian food. You're going to be my head chef. I don't really care if you're passionate about it. But as long as you can execute, you're my guy. So these chefs would do these meals. And then on Sunday or Monday, when the restaurant was closed, they would go home for their friends. And they would cook these small little meals, six, seven person meals on their day off. And their friends would be like, you know, get to share in that experience. And it was usually something that they cared about. It was grandma's recipe or 
maybe they just started dating someone who was into healthy living, so they were experimenting with these new concepts. So that idea is what we said, hey, look, come work with us, come click it over a crappy apartment, and we'll give you a platform to experiment with your new idea. And they said, how are you going to get feedback to us? Like, what's the, like, how is that going to help me at all? We said, what are the things that you're worried about when you cook? They said, well, the presentation, the execution, the temperature, the portion size, the creativity of the dish. So we came up with this idea. We said, look, maybe people, when they're dining, will buy into this concept of helping a chef iterate and grow. So we designed these little feedback cards, and we put them in front of people, and we had no idea what was going to happen. So people showed up to the events, and they started filling them out in their entirety. And they became sort of a conversational topic. Uh, we looked, and we A-B tested it. We installed GoPro cameras over the top of a table. And we measured, basically, when people, when we had the feedback card and when we didn't have the feedback card, what engagement looked like amongst people at the table. And we saw that people were staying for about 30% longer after a meal ended when we had the feedback card there. Because I'm sitting next to someone I don't know. What's a great conversational starter? What do you think of the last course? So we're like, all right, maybe there's something actually to this idea of, of feedback. Um, and the reason why I say 97% or 95 or so percent of our people fill it out in its entirety, the other 5% are usually wine-soaked feedback cards. So usually the feedback, you have to sort of qualify it as the meal progresses. If you do an eight-course meal with wine pairings, the feedback that you're getting around course seven or eight is you know, usually a little bit looser on the handwriting. The numbers get a little bit bigger. Um, it's a little bit more interesting there. So with our concept, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we had to do was the logistics. Uh, we host an event in a different location every single time. We do about 80 events a year per city, which means that my front of the house managers and back of the house managers are working with a new chef in a new location uh, with a new cuisine type every single time. It sounds like hell. It, it actually is. But the culinary people that we attract are people who are tired, again, of cooking the same thing day in, day out. So on Monday, our people get to cook Cantonese food, and on Friday, they get to cook pasta. And then on the next week, they're working with basically a revolving door of talent. So I knew, um, once we had two employees in this concept, we had about 1,000 members in New Orleans, I knew that we had to scale. Because our chefs were coming to us and saying, this is amazing for us to get this feedback and this type of data from this market. But how is New Orleans different than anywhere else? This is one subset group. So we expanded into Austin, Texas. And everyone was saying, this is a concept that can't scale. This is a logistical nightmare. So of course, me being 27 at the time was like, we're going to scale it. Um, and we did. And as we got that concept there, we started to see this sort of culinary diffusion between the two groups. So we would take someone in Austin, Texas, which is a very barbecue-based culture, and we would export them to New Orleans and take our New Orleans chefs who were cooking Creole food and export them to Austin and look at the data. So it was at that point where everything was being done in Google Docs. We weren't like this super techie company where we knew our systems were breaking. So we invested in Salesforce and basically tied in a really nice back end where we were able to manipulate the data that we were collecting based on the protein use, based on the cooking style, based on the age demographics of the people attending. And even at two cities, the data wasn't compelling enough. So I knew that we had to expand beyond that. So we decided to announce a seven city expansion and um, we have since grown to 10 cities. <laughs> I see a lot of <laughs> crazy looks. Um, but one of the things that we've actually started to see is that, look, having a couple hundred people eat a dinner, is the data that compelling? I don't know. Having it in a couple in 10 cities, I think it's a little bit more compelling. So as we started to get this information to bubble up to the surface, we did what anyone, at least you would think to do with data. We tried to sell it. So. Uh, someone gave me this advice, and I feel the need to pass it along to the rest of this, uh, to this room. Uh, ironically, we're in the food space, so this works. But they said, when it comes to data, eat your own cooking first. And that's something that we figured out the hard way. But we took this data, and we said, look, if you're going to redesign your menu, if you're going to do whatever, we can actually tell you what's working in this market versus not. The interesting thing about the restaurant world is that it's based a lot on ego. Uh, and uh, people looked at our data, and they were like, we don't care. The whole restaurant concept hasn't changed at all. For those of you who don't know, restaurants were started, for the most part, uh, for weary travelers in France, right? So the people who were traveling across the world, they were going into boarding houses, and they didn't know where to eat because everyone was cooking at home. So these hotels had to provide food. The next person who opened the restaurant said, hey, that concept is really interesting. I wonder if it'll work as a standalone restaurant. And that was the last time you've seen any innovation 
in the restaurant opening industry. It has always been someone coming forward and saying, I have an idea about what can work and what needs to be in the world, and then planting a flag and hoping that it works. Well, we were looking around and we saw celebrity chefs like Emeril Lagasse, who some of you may have heard of, who's had to close a restaurant in the last two years. Tom Colicchio, one of the celebrity chefs on Top Chef, had to close a restaurant in the last two years. And I think this goes to show this point is that no one has any idea what consumers want, ourselves included. And anyone who does is, is full of it. So we said, look, take this lean methodology, and what we can do is, if you have a new concept for a menu, if you have a new idea for a restaurant, let's battle test it in a very lean way, and then we can ship that all over the country. And everyone looked at us in the industry and said, no thanks, we're good here. We know it works. We know it doesn't work. So we decided to use that information for ourselves. So what we've done is we've basically have taken our 10 best chefs from the data that we've collected, and then we've put them on the road. So we have 10 chefs cooking in 10 different cities, and they basically rotate around the country. And we're starting to see trends in the market. It's not, hey, look, we can pinpoint the next kale before it happens. We don't pretend to have that exact science down by any stretch of the imagination. What we can do is we can look at a market and see where consumer behavior dictates a certain type of cuisine being there. So here's the thing about dining. Food culture is spread all over the world. And it's the most exportable thing. If you look at it, Top Chef is being filmed in 135 countries, Head Hell's Kitchen in 140. People are really into the idea of food and food culture. The problem is to build a restaurant to get a new concept off the ground is a very antiquated process. It takes a while. It's very capital intensive. So even in markets without a huge diversity in cuisine, there's a huge desire for certain things. So not every market looks like New York, not every market looks like Paris or London, where they have a huge dearth of, of culinary experiences that you can have. What we're able to do is to try a bunch of stuff and see what consumer behavior in that market dictates. Now the tricky part is, is that we've tried to take this information and say, will someone help us open, open a restaurant? And no one has basically done that. So we've pooled our own capital and we'll open our first restaurant in six months. And we're actually gonna do that in Nashville, Tennessee. And we think, that we figured out a cuisine type that'll work there. The challenging part of this business uh, in our industry is that we, I have 25 or 30 employees based in New Orleans, and I have another 30 employees that are spread out across the country, uh, about two to three employees per city that we operate in. So when you look at something that's experience-based, no one in my Los Angeles market knows who I am. No one in my Austin, Texas market knows who I am. Yet every one of those markets has to operate with a central core thesis about who we are as a company. And maintaining company culture across state lines and soon to be uh, international borders has proven to be one of the most challenging aspects of our business. I, I was joking with a couple people at lunch that I would take a business trip for three days and I would return and I would see new bodies in our, alive bodies. I would see new bodies in our office. And I'd be like, who is this? And they'd be like, that's your HR director. And I'd be like, oh, nice to meet you. We hired someone in 2013 every five days, um, which sounds really cool. But when I say that we're a company that was headquartered in a ground floor apartment in New Orleans, we outgrew that. We started working in my apartment in the French Quarter, uh, which my girlfriend loved. Um, we had 25 people working out of my apartment. And then we were negotiating a lease space um, that was about 4,000 square feet that we thought we would never fill. And the second we moved in, about two months ago, we've already started our hunt uh, for new space. Rapid growth in this industry is one of the most challenging, more so than a tech company where you can just hire a bunch of developers. When you're in the business of providing an experience for someone, being able to grow and scale and maintain your culture has been proven to be one of the most difficult, difficult parts of, of who we are and, and what we do. And, and I urge strong caution about rapid growth in our industry. I say that, uh, and tomorrow morning, Eastern, I guess it's, yeah, tomorrow morning, we'll actually expand to another 10 cities. So we'll go from 10 cities uh, to 20 tomorrow morning, and we'll basically finish our footprint in the United States of America. And the idea and why people keep looking at me saying, why do you guys keep growing at the rate that you're growing, or why are you doing what you're doing? Every market that we add, every single chef that we get in contact with is a new idea that we have access to. And when it comes to data, when it comes to really making sense of what you're using and what you're doing, I think you first have to make sense for it, of it for your own core business and then figure out how it's applicable anywhere else. One of my uh, very close mentors does all of the pricing for Delta, um, so all the flight pricing. 
<clears throat> and you would think that these algorithms are very exact science. But what's actually really funny and what I've learned over time about data is that the most high level data conversations are philosophical in nature. So they're designing an algorithm for a pricing schedule for Delta that's based in psychology and fear and consumer behavior. And I am highly suspect of anyone that use, utilizes data that is away from the consumer. And that's what we really are trying to do is to use data to drive as much behavior as humanly possible to make a more informed decision about what can work as cheaply as possible. Our industry is broken. It's absurd the fact that you have to spend between a million and three million dollars to see if a concept has legs. There's something deeply flawed and wrong with that. And there's a leaner approach that can be taken that utilizes consumer behavior to do something slightly different. And, and that's really the approach that we've tried to take with our business and what we're trying to grow and scale across the country. Now, where I do think we've been really fortunate is that we've figured out a way to operate a paid focus group uh, while maintaining a really strong brand. And that's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but that's certainly one that we're really proud of um, that we've been able to grow. So uh, with that, I'll open up to any questions you guys uh, may have. Uh, we'll take it from there. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to come join you on stage, bro. You can just yell it. It's oh. cool. It works. Oh. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up a bit about the culture, like your rapid expansion and keeping the company culture um, sort of coherent. And uh, and some, I just wanted to dive into a bit more of the challenges of that, if you can give me some examples of where it went wrong maybe or what some lessons learned. Yeah, I think one of the most difficult parts about having a startup company uh, is that the profile of the employee from employee zero to employee 25 looks a lot different than employee 25 to 75, looks a lot different than employee 75 to 100, um, or 100 plus. And when you're in a rapid growth startup, some of the people that you're able to attract initially, I, I joke that our company was like Lord of the Flies for a little bit. We were trying to attract 20 something year olds that would work for low wages out of a ground floor apartment that were attracted about the idea. Uh, and as we grew, we hired data scientists. So you go from having someone who's right out of college, who just is really passionate about food, for someone who ran MX's data analytics for 20 years. It's a very different profile of a human being, and those two cultures do not mesh all the time, unless you are able to be very, very clear about what works and what doesn't. And I think for us, you know, there's, a, there's this context, uh, spectrum of, of business operations. And in a startup culture, employees zero to 25 are the people who like going from nothing to something. And then there's the something to something good. And then there's the good to great. And then the great to world class. I, I'll be 100% honest. I have no interest in even running my own company from great to world class. Once we hit 50 markets or whatever, someone can come in and, and do their own thing. I love this mess. But you also have to understand that that's going to be a very specific profile of a human being that you're attracting to the table. And once you hire an HR person, the earlier employees are like, what the hell is this? I can't cuss in an email anymore, or I have to watch what I say. That's a really big deal for people. Um, and just basically having really defined roles. You know, A startup is basically everyone jostling for elbow room, trying to figure out what needs to be done, and then executing against it. But as you get to be more of a nuanced business, there are very specific roles. You have a finance person. You have an operations person. You have siloed departments that don't necessarily interact on a very regular basis. So as a company, it forced us to, instead of just being 15 you know, cool kids that were sitting in a room you know, trying to talk about you know, the culture is very permeable then. It's, 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 you could feel it in the air. But you actually have to articulate and define some of those things. And that was a very weird experience for me. And you have to, as a leader, not just talk about them, but, but lead by example. And for us, one of the biggest things for me as part of my experience was we take our work very seriously, but we do not take ourselves very seriously. Um, and that we're also part of the fortune of you that get to make our living off of food and drink. Those are two of the staples and pillars that I wanted to build a company on. And those are things that take constant reminding and everything that we do is surrounded by that. And when you're talking about growing very fast, I mean, literally, the second you hire a new employee, I don't care if you have an organization of 1,000 or even an organization of five, the second you hire a new employee, the first couple of days, weeks, or whatever, are, are really them trying to figure out their elbow room. Picture doing that 
and then three days later, hiring someone else, and then three days later, hiring someone else, and then three days later, hiring someone So literally, it was a land grab uh, for what everyone's doing and trying to hit that stasis again. Uh, if you can do it slower, do it slower. If you can't, then you can't. We couldn't. Um, and I, I definitely urge doing it in chunks. I think some Fortune 500 companies have really figured this out. They do hiring days where they hire 20 at a time. I'm a big believer from a culture standpoint to do it as a rip off a Band-Aid with that one and train everyone centrally because we actually were hiring people while I was on the road, while some of my senior management was on the road. So they would literally, uh, that wasn't a joke what I described earlier. I would come back and there'd be three new employees in the office. And I'd be like, who is this person? Um, that's a very weird experience. I would urge not to do that. Yes. Mm. What do you see for the future was the question. What, what do I see for the future? Um, so in terms of the, the future, right, restaurants, people always ask, I think someone joked at lunch too, like, do you hate restaurants? I love restaurants. <laughs> like, I, I really do. I think the way that we're interacting with food is changing. Um, not, and a lot of people have taken that from like a healthy food, where does your food come from angle. I think from a cultural standpoint, things are starting to change. I'm, I'm 28 years old. I think my generation and the generation following behind me don't really care as much about their apartment or their car or their watch. Uh, they're less likely to drop $5,000 a month on rent and a lot more likely to drop $500 on dinner. And they're looking for a different experience than I think my father was looking for. My dad wanted to go to a very fine dining, white tablecloth restaurant where the waiter was kind of a jerk. And he felt like the occasion that he was going in for was something that was elevated out of the class that he was in. And I think that that had a very uh, specific intention and moment in time where people desired that. They wanted to feel like they belonged in a room that they didn't have a right to be in. And I think our, our dining culture has been oriented around that. I think nowadays, from a clothing perspective, from a huge retail perspective, some of the wealthiest people we know don't want you to know that they're that wealthy, and they want their food to be approachable. I'll, I'll joke with you about this story. Uh, for those of you who are sort of familiar with the New York dining scene, I went to go uh, meet a friend at a restaurant called Marea, and these are some of the more wealthy people in the country. Uh, it was a Michelin one-star rated place in New York City, and they said, come meet me for dinner. I'd just gotten off a plane from LA. I said, there's no way I want to go there. I'm in shorts. Like, my hair's all over the place. I'm like, they're going to be jerks to me. They're like, no, it'll be fine. Like, we were ordering vintage wine. Like, it's not, they're not going to be mean. I walk into the dining room, and the guy's like, we can't let you in with shorts on. And I was like, really? Is this still a thing? Um, but, it, but it is. So we went, after there, we went up the road to a place called the Spotted Pig, which also has a Michelin star, and is probably one of the most approachable restaurants in the world. And I think from a dining culture perspective, we want our food to be amazing and world class, but we don't want it to be this establishment. We want our food to be very approachable. We want to be with our friends. We want to meet new people. You look at the dining scene. We do community dining. I don't necessarily think that everyone needs to do that. David Chang does that with Momofuku and some other places. I think it has a very specific moment in time. Um, but I do think that people want to meet new people. They want to interact in a much different, more laid back way. But that doesn't mean that the product can drop. Um, but I don't think that you know some of the best places in the world, you know, people are discovering hole in the walls again, and those are Jesus. Sorry about that. Uh, those are actually becoming cool again. Whereas before it used to be, I want to spending four months to get a reservation at a at a fine dining establishment. I, I don't think it's cool or trendy anymore, and I don't see that going away. I don't see our generation being all of a sudden waking up and saying, I want to eat at a place where the waiter's in a tuxedo and is kind of a jerk. Question in the middle over there. So what's, the mm. what's your con concept? So our concept is going to be very approachable, fast, casual, um, and this is something that we battle tested with a former um, chef from uh, David Chang. Actually, he's a former Momofuku guy. We put him on the road across the country, and where the data scored the highest was in Nashville, and it's a Central American, a Central Mexican theme. It's his grandma's recipes. Um, and that's the thing about the, the industry. I, I talk with a lot of private equity people who always are calling and saying, what's the new concept? Because they look at things that are, you know, Indian Tex-Mex fusion. And they're like, I don't, is that going to work? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I have no clue, just like you have no clue, except I'm not taking $20 million bets on it. But what we did was we toured this guy around the country. Uh, he honed in on the concept and the, and the menu offering. And now we're going to do something in that market where the data was the most compelling. Uh, on a fast casual kind of uh, environment. Similar to like a Shake Shack S model, um, which is one of Danny Meyer's burger joint in New York, um, which is actually where he makes like 85% of his revenue from. 
which is interesting. Uh, something similar to that. Hello. Any more questions? Um, I had a question. Um, I wanted to know about the questions you had on your questionnaire. Um, which were the most informative um, that help you build your data sets? Um, so for uh, for me, there's um, we do everything prefix. So most of our all of our menus are between five and thirteen courses. I mean, sometimes we jump higher than that. Um, so one of the most interesting things to me is where the marketing uh, coincides with taste. So we actually have seen that what draws people to a prefix menu, because we ask what tr attracted you to this menu and made you sort of transact, is very, very, very rarely the thing that they enjoyed the most at a, at a meal. So that's been really compelling for us to sort of figure out that sweet spot. Uh, let me sort of preface this with who we are as a, as a company. There's like the El Bulis and the Ferrans of the world who are amazing, who you know, are sort of doing their own creative thing. Uh, and then there are the people who are banging out Chipotles left and right. We try to sit somewhere in the middle of those two concentric so circles. Chipotle is a beautiful thing. Uh, I, I love them. And I think Ferran is fantastic as well. But where I think there's magic is in using what is creative and interesting and resonating with people and then doing something that is commercially viable. So I, I think that that is where there's magic because I do think it's sort of a lot easier to just sit in a creative place and just say, we're going to be the guys who throw stuff at a wall, and you're going to love it, um, versus you know the other side of the spectrum. And I think it's really difficult to play in the middle. And to be honest with you, I would not sit here and, and pretend to be a data expert. We're going to figure that out as we go along. But the one thing that I, that I promise you, uh, even with our fast casual restaurants, Everything that we do will be predicated off of feedback. I think that when you look at this industry, how feedback is utilized is, is abominable. I think I've read um, uh, less than 1% of diners actually fill out feedback cards that are given in a receipt feed. Uh, and then the typical way feedback gets to the back of the house is, I mean, for those of you who work in the industry, picture the last time you went out to a place that you knew the chef. The chef walks out or the owner walks out. They say, how was everything? And you give the same answer that we all give, which is everything was fantastic. And then they leave, and you're in the car with your girlfriend on the way home. And you're like, that appetizer sucked, right? And the only outlet for that is Yelp, where you're basically getting com people complaining about service. So you're giving all the oil to the squeaky wheel. But there's no constructive way for feedback to enter into the back of the kitchen when we all know that no matter what course, no matter what dish you present, it's not perfect. It's, and it can always get better. The, what, what's happened in the industry, though, is we've relied on the New York Times and the LA Times and these people who are supposed to be the, the thought leaders that basically puts the power in five people's hands. We believe in decentralizing that, and we're still tweaking what those, what those attributes are, but we think that if you can get enough data points, the data normalizes. Like, when we sit down with our chefs, we're not inserting our opinion. I'm always wrong. I look at a menu and I think this is going to be amazing and consumers hate it. All we're doing is basically saying we are a messenger for what 250 people in the city are saying and if you don't listen you're an idiot. And then some of them don't though, right? Some of them say it was just that market, let me try it again in New York. And they try it again in New York and it bombs. We're, do we're dealing with this with a chef right now who I joke is uh, like trying to make Avatar the movie in the 1980s. I think it's a concept that could work. I think it's too soon. Um, and he's tried it four times now, uh, five times. And he's gotten ripped apart in every city that he's operating. These aren't small cities. This is Miami, New York, Chicago, LA, San Francisco. And he's sticking to his guns. But the thing about data in this industry is that it's always going to be a creative endeavor. It will always be a creative endeavor. However, I think that we should have a desire to wrap our arms around as much data as possible to make that creative decision. I, I was joking with people about, at lunch that in this, in, you know, back before there was radar, it used to be assumed that pilots, like one in nine, would, would die when they took off because that's just the way the industry is. That's what the restaurant industry is right now. It's just assumed that one in three are going to bomb because that's just the way it is. That's absurd, uh, in our opinion. So hopefully we can beat that in average with our restaurants is the idea. More questions from the floor? I have a question for you, Brian. How do you change minds? You said that the industry is quite stayed, how, how do you change minds beyond just the evidence part? Because data can be wrong sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, so one of the things, you know, we originally tried to force that square peg through a round hole about trying to force our data onto people. Uh, what I've noticed is that as you're this kind of person beating the drum in the, in the, in the woods, actually, I'll tell you this story. Um, I was fortunate enough to sit with uh, one of the founders of Foursquare uh, a couple of months ago, and he was telling me the story about how they were talking about how behavioral uh, GPS locating data was going to change everything. 
and everyone was looking at them like they were insane. And they just kept beating this drum, and no one cared until all of a sudden everyone cared. And it became sort of this staple in our culture about who we are and, and how we choose to interact with each other. When we look at data, we've surrounded ourselves with people who believe in our concept, uh, and we've pieced them together slowly over time. Our, our lead investor with our company is the chairman of the board of Whole Foods. Um, Whole Foods is a healthy food retail, um, but he was also in the 1980s talking about doing healthy food retail, where people were like, you're absolutely insane. So what's really cool for us about our industry is that we've been able to attract a couple of weirdos along the way. Uh, and then you start to look back and you're like, wow, there's actually a couple hundred people who feel this way. But at the end of the day, if, if we can't utilize this information to open a, a successful restaurant, uh, it's all for naught. We might as well be operating a nonprofit uh, for chefs, which is not, we have no interest in doing. However, we're saying that we can actually use our data <clears throat> to open the next large you know, idea in food. So whether we can do that or not, TBD. But I think success ultimately uh, forces you to that, forces people to look at you. So when will you or have you already started creating your own food genres? And I'm not talking about fusion. Our own food what? Genres. Say it one more time. Genres of genres. food. Oh, God. Um, it's so funny because everything that we do, if I could be 100% honest, is not new uh, at all. In fact, most of our best ideas uh, are the things that resonate with consumers the most or the oldest. Uh, the, the concept that I'm talking about in Nashville is his grandmother's recipes. Um, most of the things that really resonate with people are, are things that are both original that you couldn't replicate if you tried, uh, and things that are so old. I'll, I'll give you an example uh, of one of my favorite uh, cuisine types. We have a chef who's Caucasian. <clears throat> He's one of Emeril Lagasse's uh, sous chefs, and he was marrying into a Chilean family, and his in-laws said, oh, you're supposed to be like this really amazing chef. I want you to cook a meal for me and all of our in-laws, all your future in-laws. So he basically came up with this concept uh, for a Chilean menu, which makes no sense because he's a white guy, um, has like no backstory, but he describes this as the meal that got his wife to fall in love with him. And he tells a story about each course and why he did it and why it makes sense, and it resonated with people. Do I think there's a commercially viable product there? Yeah, I do. Can you recreate that story if he sat around in a room with five people? No. Uh, however, for that story, I have another 20 that didn't work. Um, and that's just sort of, I think, tapping into that the only thing, the only strategic advantage that I have as a company is that I work with a couple thousand chefs and I try a couple thousand concepts a year. We're, we're just a lot leaner than taking $20 million bets. I take a couple thousand dollar bets all day long. So is your product the food or is your product the narrative? That's a great question. Um, I think there's something really interesting about, again, sitting in the middle of those two things. Um, I think restaurants that do a really good job about putting that narrative forward in, in a non-obnoxious way, where it's not sort of dictated from the top down, um, have done a really good job. And I think that that narrative, that experience is sort of what we're seeking or what I believe consumers are seeking nowadays, which is a little bit more on the experiential side as opposed to just saying, here's a high-end Italian place, go sit down and eat there. People want to hear a little bit more of the backstory. They want to hear why this is on the menu now. Uh, and I think there's something there. And I think we as industry, I hate to use the word industry leader because I was literally cooking food illegally out of a ground floor apartment a year ago. But I think as people who are sort of pushing this industry forward, I think those are things that we absolutely have to listen to. Otherwise, we're going to be a relic of the past. Okay. Are there any more questions from the floor? Oh, Brian, you know, I'm very interested about your, your creative mindsets. Can you, can you tell us a little bit, you know, to, um, the point you get $300 in your pocket, you know, you come up with all this, but the making of your creative minds, you know, a little bit of your previous experience and just curious about that. Yeah, so when I worked for an educational, when I worked for the educational investing company, uh, we had a very positive culture, uh, one that was very yes and, right? You weren't allowed to shoot down ideas. If you're gonna, someone threw out an idea, you had to say yes, and what if we did this? At Dinner Lab, we have the exact opposite. Um, we have a mentality that we have from the top down, which is that no concept is stupid, uh, and anything can be tested as long as you can test it, prove it to be successful within a week and with $500. So any employee, all of our best ideas come from our employees, uh, and from sometimes from our members and, or consumers. They basically will say, hey, we want to try this, or hey, have you thought about trying whatever? We'll try anything that doesn't really, that isn't egregious to the brand, as long as it can be proven to be successful within a week and can be tested in a week. 
So we are really fortunate, and most of you are probably fortunate for those of you that own restaurants or are in that space, is that you have these little testing grounds. So for you to test something on a two top or a four top, like who cares, try it, why not? Uh, and I think we happen to have a company that's predicated entirely off of feedback, but we also have one where you're allowed to say an idea completely sucks as long as you have a better one. So we are not allowed to sit in meetings, like not that we're not allowed, I mean we make the rules, but it's like, we, in every meeting, if someone says, like, that's a terrible idea, the, ne the next question is, do you have a better one? And if the answer is no, then just stop talking and let's move on. So that's sort of the culture that we've tried to instill, which I think is very positive, uh, but it also sort of recognizes what I think that we recognize as a company, which is that we have no idea what we're doing. Uh, and trying to keep up with consumer behavior is impossible to do. So test as much stuff as humanly possible, and then what works, scale it. And that's like, we have you know, 20 operations now, so we can try it in one place, expand it to two, three, four, as long as we have a clear way to prove that it's successful. I, I don't think we're creative at all, to be honest with you. I think that we tap into the ideas that a lot of people have and just test more stuff than anyone else. So, so now you've got, you, know, um, you have tested you know, the market, you've run it. Would you do it, would you select other places outside the world or would you just not do restaurants and you want to move on to something else? Do we want to do more restaurants, is that the question? Outside US or would you like to move yeah. on to something else? Yeah, so we're going to scale, we're going to scale the core operation uh, globally uh, is the idea, uh, but we have a few other ideas. So when I say that we are a consumer dining experience, uh, I think our role in this space now is to bring consumers in contact with new ideas and food. So we're starting to dance into the content editorial side a little bit. Um, and I think utilizing our data, uh, you know, I have no problem saying it out loud. Like, I think Yelp is is ripe to be taken down, and I would love to throw a rock <laughs> at that eyeball. Cool. I think we are times up. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate it.